Let us get started. Um, yep, Carlos Santana. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Paul from IBM. Both for IBM. You you can't follow me on Twitter because I'm not on it. <laughs> uh, let's get started with uh, talking about Cold Start. So just an introduction. Uh, we saw that some people were new to Knative. So to give an introduction of what is Knative serving, it simplifies the deployment. Um, like mentioned before, of Kubernetes abstractions. Um, it has traffic splitting, which uh, we saw a great demo by uh, Bloomberg, how they use traffic splitting and then rollouts. And um, one of the, my favorite features of is auto, auto TLS HTTPS. So you define your service and um, Knative serving takes care of defining the route and the traffic aspect of it and the configuration. Um, as always in uh, Kubernetes CRDs, you can compose them, them as separate things, router and configuration, but we suggest to use uh, serving. So serving is, uh, we have seen many talks about that, is uh, scaling to zero, but I think the most difficult problem from scaling to zero is scaling back to one. Like I always like to joke. Uh, next slide. Um, so just for uh, reminders, and I, I get this question uh, a lot, is uh, people ask us like, how do we, how Knative scales to zero? And I usually kind of like, as I said, well, and the interesting part is how it scales to one is the interesting thing, not scale to zero. And some people actually think, we have joke about this, that this, there's some magic and sprinkles in the cluster that makes this happen, but actually there's uh, engineering involved, right? And if people want to get um, you know, contributions and, and learn, I know a lot of people want to learn how it works. Uh, this is a good opportunity to get involved and actually help with coding, testing, and involving uh, serving. So uh, the working group is always looking for contributions. So uh, one simple example is like the life of the query, wanting to make this a little bit simpler for people to use. But when you start with a Kubernetes cluster, you usually have a request coming in into an ingress. In our case, would be something like Contour, Courier, uh, Istio. You don't have to use Istio. Um, we have a service. Um, it's a, a type of service, but it represents the same abstraction. But the key aspect is there's no pods. So there's a deployment out there for every revision, but there's zero pods. So how do we get that request to a pod that doesn't exist? Usually that's, that's the key question. And the answer to that is the activator. And I love the names that we give these two guys, activator and autoscaler. They sound like um, transformers. So I'm a fan of transformers. Um, so we have the activator, and the activator is in charge in there of like, if there's no pod to receive this request, I'm going to go into the middle there. So the endpoints get configured to be able to capture that request and take the, the aspect. But somebody needs to get one pod up. So this is Kubernetes. We're managing Kubernetes. Um, so that's what the aspects of Kubernetes native is Kubernetes native. So the activator needs to tell like I need the first pod. So how does that happen? So that happens through the activator communicating with the autoscaler and the autoscaler like normal Kubernetes will set the, the replica set to one. And this is where things start slowing down. Telling Kubernetes, give me one pod and eventually a pod would exist. And when the pod comes up, we have to bring up minimum two uh, containers. If you're using Istio with mesh, it should be three, but in our simple example, it will be a, the Q proxy, which is another component of Knative. This is the explanation of how do we scale to one, and then our application. So the, our application is the one that, that boots up and, and comes up. The Q proxy usually sp spins up very fast. It's a very simple, um, low, low um, container, but the application defines how long your pod will come up and be ready. And then the queue proxy start like pinging the app and you're ready uh, to see if it can receive that. Once it does that, the activator says, okay, I can send, start sending requests to the queue proxy and the queue proxy is there to measure the concurrency um, uh, for the autoscaler to be um, scraping. So the autoscaler now start getting the metrics from that queue proxy and decides when is enough uh, traffic coming in that you need two replicas and then the next one comes up you, have, you get the no next deployment, you hit your cold start, depending how warm uh, type of uh, levels of heat you have, um, and then the activator sends that to the queue proxy. And eventually, it gets to a stable, sta stable state that we um, the, the system can 
get to it, that then the activator is not in the critical path and it goes there. So this is kind of like uh, one of the latest um, examples and somebody was saying there needs to be a way to, like we need more type of these diagrams to explain to newcomers how things work inside so they get used to uh, in terms of using it and operating it in terms of uh, operators. Um, so that's, that's the service. Once it gets into a stable state um, and there's enough, as you said, um, capacity um, to sustain the load, then the activator doesn't have to be in the middle. But activator is a, a primary uh, thing there. So I'll leave it there. What happens there when we need that first spot? Yep. So just again, talking in terms of timing, what are the things that have to happen between when the request is received a, when the request is processed, so Carlos kind of over this, but just to kind of recap here, let me speak into the microphone. Um, the request comes in, it gets routed to the activator, the activator triggers the autoscaler, the autoscaler updates the replica count, the pod is created and ready, the activator knows the pod is ready, the activator forwards the request to QProxy, QProxy forwards it to the app, the app responds to the request and the request is processed. So this is just kind of the list of the eight things that have to happen. If we were to represent this more in kind of a, you know, how long each one of them takes, you would see that the pod being created and ready is what takes the longest amount of time. Now, why is that? That's because there's a whole lot of things that are happening there. We have to create the container. We have to perhaps pull the image if it's not already cached on the node. We have to wait for the containers to start. We have to wait for all the probes to run. So there's a lot of things that are happening there. And there's a lot of kind of different scenarios. Carlos mentioned the levels of heat uh, that we're pulling from a presentation that Matt had made previously. Um, but we'll call them different kinds of latency types. And what this means is it's really just referring to the different types of scenarios on a particular node. So there's kind of two kind of main variables here. One, is the container running on that node? Yes or no. Two, has that image been cached on that node already? Yes or no. And so what we'll call a cold start is when that node does not have the container cached on it and, or the image cached on it, and the container is not running. That's the cold start. That's what takes the longest amount of time to happen. Uh, next would be what we call a warm disk. That's when the image has already been cached on said node, but the container is not actual, actively running. Um, a warm memory scenario, that's when the container has been paused. So the container is up, but it's been paused. It's not kind of actively serving requested as it's been paused by the container runtime or something like that. And then finally, what we call the warm CPU scenario where that container is actively running and can serve requests kind of immediately. So thanks to Matt for kind of those categories there. Um, and kind of that's kind of the problem space that we find ourselves in. Now the question is, how can we make things faster? So back to Carlos. Yep, thank you. So what, what things you can use in user land? And uh, we get a lot of questions in, in, in Slack. Um, about uh, cold starts, and one of them is uh, image pools. So uh, one aspect of, of this in, in general general terms for the talk is uh, looking at how to speed the cold starts, but also how to avoid cold starts. Um, if, if, they can pa if they can happen infrequently, then you are in a better, better luck with that. So image pools, there's a lot of talks and a lot of conventions, actually a lot of tools, um, a lot of innovation in the count, count, uh, CNI space, um, also the OCI space and the cloud native space around um, how do we pull the bits that I need? Uh, it's like a, like a star GZ. Uh, always um, don't use always pull, and always pulls is also something that some users cannot avoid because you're working maybe in a multi-tenant environment, so you you don't want another pod from another user or, or a bad actor to like use your image that you catch. So you always ask uh, always pull. But if you can avoid that, always like don't use latest tag um, and cache the image on the nodes. That's kind of like the the best one. So uh, another one is like getting the, the image closer. So I'll talk if if uh, on a few of them. The other one is init optimization. It's like what what can you do in your code or your framework or the type of initialization that you're doing, right? What are the things that you're loading at boot time that you can maybe do later? Uh, or maybe you don't, maybe th the type, based on the type of request, you never actually, there's no code path in there. And um, the last one also is hidden costs. Uh, some people are using certain components or frameworks or something from a cloud provider that they don't know that is affecting their code star. So I'll give two examples of that around Istio um, and, and CNI. And then I, like I said, um, the other strategy is try to avoid the, the code start, right? Instead of like, uh, they, they are costly, so see if you can modify maybe the concurrency and other aspects to just avoid them. So we'll touch uh, on some of them, and this is like um, a lot of users uh, need kind of guidance on 
what other things are available. So one is always uh, forcing the image, uh, the image pool at deployment time. This is something that you can do um, on your own. Like for example, you can de deploy with the CLI, the candidate service, and then behind the scenes, try to deploy something that will go to certain nodes. Like maybe your, your services run in certain nodes from your cluster. So you create a deployment, a, a daemon set that just pulls the image, but it doesn't do anything. Um, there's some old, also like you can do things like deploy the service, but never make it run the first pod. There's a flag and an annotation for that. And also we have in Knative a, a CRD where CR get, get, gets created per revision and it has all the information from I guess the parent, the owner that created that revision, and it has the URL that the controller does the tag resolution. So we always like try to match the tag to the shasum. So we give we have the, the the long image tag, and you can write your own controller or or um, that that knows what are the images that need to be uh, downloaded. And uh, so there's some community repos that have an implementation of that, but it could be as simple as watching this resource that it comes up that Knative creates for someone to create, to implement it. So that's one way of, and, um, and, and uh, again, even if you have an image registry that is located in the same availability zone or VPC or from the provider, um, it, would not, it would not solve all your issues just by downloading the image. Sometimes the image is very small and that's not where the most of the time is spent and Paul is going to talk about where is that spent. Um, some languages, I think somebody asked earlier about choosing a language. Um, I understand that some companies or some projects they don't have a choice to select the language, but certain functions, like uh, Mauricio was explaining, so certain functions are maybe uh, done in async way and they can choose a language, and where other functions can be written in other language. So you can have a polyglot of languages, but be careful because some languages, like I show here, like for a, like a straight Java, will take a long time, but if you use something like GraalVM and compile that with Quarkus or just GraalVM, you, can co you have a uh, faster speed up, and this is kind of like, comparing the, the boot time for different languages. So um, that, that's part of the init optimization there. And then another one that people, uh, I guess is, is, is uh, for some of us that we've been involved of trying to solve this issue for everyone the best way possible. Some users are fine to set these some knobs that we have, but the thing is sometimes they're not aware that these knobs exist. So for example, on the last talk that we're talking about setting the mean scale, right? Minimum set of replicas. And some users are okay at this time by paying that, that penalty of having a pod running 24 seven, but it will be running 24 seven, Kennedy would not shut it down. The other way that you can have is another knob is scale down delay, which is, uh, once the queue proxy reports that there's no more requests coming in, that it's okay to scale to zero, it tells the system, hey, wait this amount of time, maybe you wait 10 minutes instead of being the default, the default is very aggressive, wait this amount of time before you shut down, will terminate the pod. And that could be a setting that can avoid the, the uh, co-stars, that we could say, avoid the, uh, have less frequency of co-stars. And the last one, it could be like, maybe you want, not every pod to be like left longer, but maybe the last pod of the revision of the deployment, leave it uh, um, alive a longer amount of time because there might be a request coming in, likely um, coming in and that, that avoids a cold start. So it's about measuring this knob. So always measure and run a load test that looks like the, your, your load, if it's bursty and measure what you change. But there's knobs that are available and sometimes we don't mention it because we want to get to that Nirvana place that co starts are like, um, you know, physics is, is zero, right? And that's not possible. And, and this one is uh, one that I, I, I think uh, for people using Istio, not everyone uses Istio, but in Istio be careful when you add Istio and you have it and on top of that, you use it in Istio um, mesh that you're adding another container that needs to boot up that needs to do things in your IP tables, that's the uh, init container. Um, plus you have your Istio side card and plus the two co containers. So everything needs to come up um, and be ready for that request to go and get processed. So that will hit your call start and you just have to measure how long uh, that will be for you. And actually we have a, 
um, a tool called Kperf that can help you merge with that. The other one that I um, recently found out about doing the end user interviews, which by the way, I'm still looking for end users, uh, grab me uh, to schedule an interview, is a type of CNI uh, cloud provider. So some cloud providers would assign you like a elastic IP or real IP, um, and that would take more time to talk to the cloud provider to get to the pool, to get the, an IP assigned to a, to a pod. Um, and this is some, sometimes a, you, this came from a user that was moving from bare metal on-premises to on-cloud, and they haven't modernized all aspects of their security model. So they need that pod to have a certain IP address. So that's it's costing them the cold start. And actually, it's, a, it's an end user that is in production, which I was super happy to hear about that. But it's something that it came up in the conversation that is, is affecting them in cold start. So watch out for those type of things of, what are the things that Container D or Kubelet are doing with a cloud provider that might hit your co-star? So sometimes it's in your hands, and sometimes it's maybe modernizing the way you deploy these worker nodes. And then we'll leave it to Paul to see what we're doing with upstream. So Carlos went over a number of ways that you know you can do things right now to kind of improve your container start time. I want to talk about some things that you will be able to do very soon. Um, that we're working on both upstream and in Knative um, to make things faster. So in upstream, we've been starting to work with the Kubernetes folks to see you know, what are ways that we can get containers to run faster. So Marcus um, went to SigNode, gave a presentation on what kind of our Knative use cases are, and we've been working with them to try to get some of these things upstreamed and find those things out. We've worked with Mike Brown, who's a Containerd maintainer, who's got a number of great ideas that we're making use of. So I want to mention a couple of them here, um, just so that we're aware uh, that these things are coming. Um, you know, we talked about the, the issue of if you have to always pull your images, you never want to use the latest tag because that takes time to have to pull an image, but it might be a security requirement if you don't want tenants to be you know, using that cached image um, on your thing. So there's this cap out there for ensure secrets pulled image that will basically allow you to not have to use the latest tag, um, oops, um, not have to use the latest tag, but still be able to, so he can kind of cache your image, but it'll still do the security authentication check in your image. That's gonna help speed up image pools, not having to use the latest tag there. There's a number of performance improvements that are happening in the CNI layer. Um, there's PRs out there that have reduced, you know, when you're loading your CNI plugins, not loading them in, uh, in parallel as opposed to in sequence, which speeds up the runtime There's stuff, disabling the DAD, which has dropped about a second off of the runtime, um, which are very good. Um, and then in terms of Kubelet performance, um, you know, one of the things we do in Knative is we run probes to make sure things are up. Probes run at a second interval. Um, so if you know it's not ready when the probe hits the first time, you got to wait another second for that thing to run again. We've got a cap out there now to run probes on a sub-second interval so we can respond even faster to things like that. And we presented the SIG node, I think, two weeks ago. Um, some of the Red Hat folks, Derek and others, mentioned that they were working on a, a similar cap on the, uh, the evented uh, plague which is gonna use Kubelet based on events as opposed to kind of the, the polling methods that should speed things up as well. So some things upstream um, in Knative itself, working on some performance enhancements as well. We're working on more probe support, adding startup probes, which hopefully make things a little faster. And then two things that I kind of want to demo for you now, um, the container freezer, which is something that Jules had POC'd a while back, but we've got it in an alpha in the sandbox, and then Kperf, which is a performance benchmarking tool that we have. Um, so the container freezer, just this is, you know, this is a similar picture we saw before. This is kind of how Knative works. We've got the activator, the autoscaler. You've got a pod that's running. What the container freezer does is it runs a separate uh, freeze daemon. And what that daemon does is it freezes um, the user pod. So when a request comes in, still follows the same uh, process, gets the queue proxy. The queue proxy calls out to the, to the daemon, sends it an unfreeze request. We then, in the container runtime, send you know, a resume request in container D, it's resume. I think we've got, there's a PR out there for cryo um, as well that unfreezes the container, allows it to run. Um, then the request goes to the application um, as normally. Nice thing about this here is you can leave your pod running um, and it's not you know, actively running. You pause it in between requests. When the request is finished, you know, the QProc sends a request back out, freeze the pod, pod gets frozen. So that's kind of out there in an alpha right now um, and people could use. All right. Um, one of the nice things about this is because you're, this is the difference between kind of that, the, you know, the, the, I forget what we call it, the warm memory, warm um, container responding to a paused or a paused pod versus not Knox 
I can't add in my head, but two seconds-ish off the time. So it definitely speeds up the, sp the, the response to a request um, when using said thing. Right. And then kind of finally, KPerf, um, it's our performance benchmarking, oh, well, oh, oops. I did want to kind of just kind of demo kind of what the container freezer looked like really quickly. Bear with me one second. So I'm just gonna kind of set this up really quickly just to kind of show kind of how this thing works. All right, so basically there's just kind of a basic service here called Sleep Talker. The Sleep Talker just kind of ticks on a thing, so I'm just kind of show this works really quick. So this is just running the log from said pod. You can't see anything um, happening right now when I call on the, well. so you're gonna see it's ticking and you can't really read what that thing says, it's tiny, but basically what happens is when the container gets its request, the pod runs, you see it in the logs. Let's show that one more time real quick. So it's tick, tick, tick. And then when the screen stops, the thing stops, that's just kind of a live demo of it actually pausing a container as it runs. Um, KPerf, which is our performance benchmarking tool, um, you can just kind of see here, I'm not going to run this up, but basically kind of you can run a number of pods, gather benchmarks on them, and kind of compare them against it. Here we're just showing kind of um, pod creation times. You can see the yellow line at the bottom, that's when the pod is scheduled. The Orange line is when the container is ready, so you can see kind of the amount of time that it takes, and you can see the different um, times that, that uh, it takes for the queue proxy to start, the user container to start. Um, so yeah, and that we can run that um, in the CI. Uh, Nader did some good work adding that um, into the CI, so we can test kind of how each PR that we add improves the performance or, or doesn't improve the performance, as the case may be. I think that covers it. Yeah, so. that's Kerp, 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 uh, generates that that's HTML graph is generated by the tool, so it's not uh, something that that you have to do anything about it. It's the tool generates that HTML and also does the does the load 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 testing, and um, it's a repo that is uh, looking for contributors. Um, so. PRs are welcome. Um, so we have yeah, that's one of the one of the repos that if you're new to to the community and is something that that you want to get started it's, it's a good one to uh small one and scope that you can help and and get started so with that um i'm glad that we cut the slides in half um i thought i'm going to go over uh questions i think that's it that's it one of them thank you uh does anyone have qu okay I'm going there. Hey, hello. Uh, so, just wanted to understand uh, exactly like what does happen behind the scene when you say a container, uh, the, uh, a pod is paused. Like, I just wanted to understand in terms of uh, like when it auto scales down to zero, we are saving on resources with respect to compute, right? Like, is that? Uh, a similar thing that we can achieve during this because the cold start definitely gets uh, off with the container pausing and unpausing. But uh, what what exactly does happen with respect to the compute resource saving? How, uh, does how 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 does that work? Like because I was actually looking into the repository, I could not find a lot of documentation around how it works. Yep. So the, the question is kind of when, when you freeze a container, what happens with the resource usage? Um, so right now what it does is it pauses CPU usage. So uh, the memory still is allocated to the pods. So you're not saving on um, memory, but you are saving on CPU. So this is, you know, 
it prevents Bitcoin miners, for example, if you've got a, an idling pod, they can't, you know, there's no uh, CPU cycles that are spinning. So kind of at the moment, it's really just saving on CPU resources as opposed to memory. And there's some things maybe down the line, like maybe like Cryo or something like that, where you might be able to kind of also save on the memory. But for the moment, it's just it's saving CPU cycles. Okay. It's Thanks. similar. It's similar if you do um, like a container have different states. A container can be stopped, can be can be running, but but also there's another state that is paused. So if you are familiar with Docker, in always been there, I think you can do Docker pause, and basically that's essentially what is what it's doing. But it, we're doing it with container ID, and there's a PR. Is the, the PR open, right? Open. Yeah. yeah. Somebody from the community did a PR to add that to Cryo. Uh, so it's a, an API that the daemon calls to cryo saying, please stop this container from this pod um, and then and then would unpause it. So pause and unpause. Yeah, yeah that was just added to uh, cryo um, in the 124 release. So that's... Yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah. It was recently added to cryo and then they, they added it. Uh, it was recently added to, because I checked and I does cryo support this and then I went over there and it was... Um, was recently added and then they jump over and then did the PR. Just to mention, because we were talking about you know contributors, this was a contributor who wanted this function for Cryo. It wasn't implemented in Cryo, so went over to Cryo, did the PR to add the implementation in Cryo, and then wrote the PR for the container freezer. So a great example of uh, community um, involvement. Any? Okay, I think we're. Uh, anyone else got questions to Carlos and Paul? Evan? Wait, you? Wait, you want to ask a question? <laughs> so, um, what, what barriers do you see to turning this on by default in uh, Knative? I think one of the big barriers right now is around kind of the, the probing interface. Right now we run a readiness probe that checks to make sure the container is ready. And if your container is paused, the readiness probe doesn't like that, um, which is hence part of the reason why we went on and want to add startup uh, probe so that we can, you know, perhaps make the readiness probe um, not always there by default. Um, so I think that that's I think that's the biggest um, thing. And then honestly, like we need to test it a lot more. It's it's alpha for a reason because it's not really been it's still still the, the ink is still wet on that one, as the case may be. Yeah, and, the, uh, and I don't know if the folks have an answer for that, but. Another one would be like take advantage through the kubelet, right? If you we set pods to have certain limits for CPUs and you have a node with four pods that are paused, you can fit other pods in there. So how do we teach Kubernetes to be aware that there's pods pods that are paused, not consuming CPU, but it's consuming memory, so you can squeeze something in, and then maybe looking into like uh, the feature about moving a a frozen container or pod from one node to another pod. That's something that I call it like the vMotion pod. <laughs> I know vMotion is a VMware, I get, I'm getting dated um, uh, in that aspect. But it's the management in piece and the pro. But the first one to, to kick out is Kubrox is not even aware that this container is frozen. So I don't know if Matt has more, more to add. I, I thought the slide said that uh, the Kubrox requested that it be frozen. Sorry? Doesn't the queue proxy reach out to the freeze daemon to tell it to freeze it? It sends like a like an event of the concurrency. Yeah, it's part part of the handler chain. So we kind of add that in there so the call will go out and we'll freeze and then when the request comes in it'll trigger it again to unfreeze. So so it should know when it's frozen. Yeah, I think we, we could add a flag in there to set this first. I don't think there's anything explicitly in there at the moment, but it, yes it could know. So I mean it also proxies all of the probes, so it could just stop probing. Yeah, um, we, we talked about that, but I think the, well, that, that's under discussion, but yeah, it technically could, yes. Okay, uh, so I'm curious what, uh, how the cry uh, interface for freezing is ACLed at the node level, and uh, how that's expressed in terms of the privilege the freeze daemon needs. Is it like, uh, I assume it's mounting something like a Unix socket to talk to 
the cry stuff? Yeah, it's mounting a unit socket, and then um, we add the, it, so it runs per node, so it's a daemon set, uh, it runs per node, it, and I think it makes the call over the socket. We um, I have to go back and look, it's been a little bit, but when we mount the secret in a, in a volume that then um, the, the service account has access to. So that, that may be another uh, thing to consider in terms of getting it on by default, as some folks may not want, you know, a new daemon set running with, you know, some significant level of capability on every node, but um, it sounds super cool. And I'm glad that that landed in CRI. Thanks. It's an early stage, yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, no. Any more questions? Anyone else? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you, Paul and Carlos, for your talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.